Welcome to the Cardboard Crash Course. My name's Ethan, and today we're looking at the L1Z1X. This is a faction from the original Twilight Imperium 1st edition, but we're going to be looking at it in the 4th edition today, upgraded by the Prophecy of Kings expansion. If you have no idea what I'm talking about, the how to play will be in the top right-hand corner there. Head to, yeah, the right-hand corner. Um, if you are super, super engaged with the channel, I would love if you hit the subscribe button and give me a like. Uh, don't hit the bell because that's super annoying. I, I never put notifications on. I would much rather you check in the description and save the Twilight Imperium Faction Guide playlist to listen on your own terms instead. If you do hit the bell, I appreciate you, but that's above and beyond what I would do. <laughs> Well, without further ado, let's go ahead and get into the component overview as well as an in-depth analysis later in the video. Thank you so much. The L1Z1X MindNet is a remnant of the old Lazax Empire. A leader named Ibma Vel Sid turned the Lazax into a technological nightmare and, although it's just rumor, has brought them back to life, claiming the throne as their own and coming back in their super dreadnoughts with more powerful assimilation technology in order to demand respect instead of receive it through benevolence. The L1Z1X will take the Lazak's throne with force, and they have no remorse for the destruction that once happened to their old empire. They start on the old Lazak's paradise world, now called 000. It has a 5 resource value and 0 influence value. This shows their more forceful nature nowadays. It's decent, and I'll talk about how to use that in the analysis, but not amazing. They also begin on that planet with one dreadnought, one carrier, three fighters, five infantry, one space dock, and one PDS. So right away, this doesn't look amazing with only one carrier, but the dreadnought is actually a super dreadnought, which we'll get to in just a moment. They also begin with two starting technologies. One is Neural Motivator. This says during the status phase, draw two action cards instead of one. Pretty straightforward and just gives them a little bit of a boost. I don't really particularly think it does anything amazing for them, but that's okay. They also begin with Plasma Scoring, a red technology. It says when one or more of your units use Bombardment or Space Cannon, one of those units may roll one additional die. Much more important for them. And again, just a moment and you'll understand. So let's look at the couple of faction abilities they have on their sheet. One is Assimilate. This says, when you gain control of a planet, replace each PDS and space dock that is on that planet with a matching unit from your reinforcements. This is their representation of how they will take planets by force, and they don't have to use the construction card to do so. Very nice. They also have Harrow. At the end of each round of ground combat, your ships in the active system may use their bombardment abilities against your opponent's ground forces on the planet. So, remember, the bombardment abilities of your ships usually only happen before the combat begins, once. This allows you to do that as well as every single time, constantly bombarding them. So, right before we get into the Super Dreadnought, let's talk about their flagship, 001, a reference to, of course, their planet. This is an 8 cost, 5 times 2 combat value, movement of 1 flagship with 5 capacity and sustained damage. Not too shabby. And it has the ability, during a space combat, hits produced by this ship and your dreadnoughts in the system must be assigned to non-fighter ships if able. So this just plows through a military force and is really quite amazing. So without further ado, let's get to those dreadnoughts. Their Super Dreadnought is specific to them. It's a 4 cost, 5 combat value, 1 movement and 2 capacity Dreadnought, with sustained damage and bombardment of 5. But that's not quite it, as it can actually be upgraded with 1 yellow tech and 2 blue to the Super Dreadnought 2. This is still a 4 cost, but changes the combat value down by 1 to a 4, which is great, boosts the movement up to 2, and keeps the capacity at 2. It keeps sustained damage, but its bombardment goes from 5 to 4, which is also awesome. It says this unit cannot be destroyed by direct hit action cards as well, which of course Dreadnoughts usually have, but is amazing on this Super Dreadnought. This is going to be the crux of the rest of their abilities going forward, especially utilizing their hero, so let's not waste time. Secondly, along with Super Dreadnought 2, they also have the faction technology Inheritance Systems, with two yellow prerequisites. 
It says you may exhaust this card and spend two resources when you research a technology. Ignore all of that technology's prerequisites. So inheritance systems kind of gives you a little bit of a hint of the Joel Nar play style, but sort of shows their old way of utilizing technology and adapting to the new technology of the new age. Really quite interesting. They also have a mech introduced in the Prophecy of Kings expansion. This is a two cost and six combat value mech with sustained damage like normal, but it also has a bombardment value of eight. And it says, when not participating in ground combat, this unit can use its bombardment ability on planets in a system as if it were a ship. So alongside their dreadnoughts and even a war sun, they can use their hero ability with their mechs. That's really a buff for them. And the annihilator kind of gets overlooked a lot of the time, I believe. Next up is their leaders. The first leader that begins unlocked is I-4-8-S. This is an exhaustible ability that says after a player activates a system, you may exhaust this card to allow that player to replace one of their infantry in the active system with one mech from their reinforcements. So not only can you use this on yourself to build those annihilators, you can actually sell that off if someone may have a more important mech than you. Next up is 2RAM. This is the commander that begins locked and unlocks when you have four dreadnoughts on the game board. When it's unlocked, it gives you the passive ability. Units that have planetary shield do not prevent you from using bombardment. So you can just rip right through PDS and even through other things that give planetary shield. This is immediately unlocking all of your dreadnoughts and mechs to be able to destroy a planet. And finally, the helmsman. This is the hero and unlocks when you have three scored objectives, public or secret, and gives you the ability dark space navigation. It's an action, and you choose one system that does not contain another player's ships. You may move your flagship and any number of your dreadnoughts from other systems into the chosen system, then purge this card. So sort of a wormhole usage, but really just allows them to appear out of nowhere and take a planet that they need. Finally, they have cybernetic enhancements. This is the promissory note that you would give away to other players. And it's an Omega, which came out in the Codex. The Codex is a print and play that's updates to the game. If you don't already have it, I'll leave the link to it in the description. They have the ability, when you gain command tokens during the status phase, gain one additional command token, then return this card to the L1Z1X player. So not the most amazing promissory note, but it's sellable all the same, even for just a trade good or two. So that's everything that the L1Z1X come with. Now, of course, they're sort of pigeonholed into this dreadnought and bombardment sort of play style, but I'll tell you how to get the most value out of it in just a moment. So the L1Z1X, this is a really interesting one. I don't particularly love them in terms of my own play style, but I think they have a place in the game for sure. Their assimilate ability especially is really unique, although I don't see it go off too often. Really quick, before we get into the rest of the analysis, I'd love to thank my patrons of the channel, all of them, especially those new ones that were not around from the last video. I really appreciate you. You have no idea how much that means to me. It's really hard for me to understand how anyone's willing to help me out, especially because I'm just a small channel. But if you're interested in that, it is in the description. It's totally up to you. Anyway, the L1Z1X have this really interesting concept. They have this focus on dreadnoughts, mechs now, and of course their flagship. Those three together, as well as their interesting faction technology, is kind of going to work together in this synergistic way. But you have to be willing to be a little aggressive now and then. They are similar in concept to the Necrovirus in terms of playstyle, and let me explain. The Necrovirus have to play tactically when it comes to being aggressive. They have to eat things small here and there in order to get technologies off of people, similar to how the L1Z1X have to take PDS and space docks in opportune moments in order to get where they need to go. The difference is the Necrovirus just taking one simple fighter or infantry or whatever off of somebody in order to get a technology, you can pay them back for that. They won't really mind too much. With the L1Z1X, they're going to mind if you destroy their PDS or their space dock. 
Even if you've come out with some sort of deal with them, they're not going to like it, I promise you. Especially if those structure objectives come out that round after you've just taken it. So you have to understand right away, you are not the friend at the table, though you do have some things to offer. I do think that the promissory note got a little bit better and you can definitely sell that, as well as their agent. Their agent being able to make mechs is very, very, very important to some factions. If you've got an Empyrean at the table, or maybe have Ghost of Kreis who needs a positioning objective, then absolutely sell it to them. You can make them yourself and it actually helps with bombardment now, but I do think that you should be trying to sell it kind of often. So knowing that you're not the friend at the table, nor are you enemy number one like Cabal, you have to understand where your strengths and weaknesses lie, and we'll start with the weaknesses. You start off with a red technology as well as a green technology. Now the red one definitely helps you out. As I said in the component overview, it helps you out a lot more than it would help out other people because of your focus on bombardment. However, getting the extra action card every turn, it just, it never feels as great as it looks on paper. If you've played Twilight Imperium enough, you know that that doesn't mean too much. And on top of that, your faction technology, especially that super dreadnought you'll be going towards, is blue and yellow, neither of what you start off with. And then Inherited Systems is too yellow. And the fact that it's getting you more technology, on top of being too yellow deep, and your Super Dreadnought means two blue and one yellow, you're gonna have to fix this early on. You need Warfare or something similar to get out to a yellow or blue technology specialty planet as soon as possible. I suggest also taking advantage of the technology secondary or even primary early on. In either round one or round two, I think that you should be going towards gravity drive and possibly even sling relay in order to assist yourself in getting your dreadnoughts far out there. They are your main source of income and you won't need the construction strategy card with them if you're playing them correctly. So focus more on technology and don't immediately buy the Super Dreadnought 2 until you absolutely need it to fight. Now, of course, you could trade off Sling Relay for Dark Energy Tap if you have a lot of Frontier tokens near you, but you need blue in order to get those out farther and Gravity Drive is your go-to. I also think that Fleet Logistics is especially important for them. Now, Fleet Logistics isn't absolutely 100% guaranteed to win you the game, but it's super important because of their hero, and we'll talk about that in a second. But first, you also have to get yellow. Now, not every faction needs it because it's just a small discount, but I do think that you should get Sarween tools because of how many times you'll be using that sling relay or even just regular production in order to build those dreadnoughts and your flagship out on forward docks. So now that you've got enough to build your Super Dreadnought 2 in that opportune moment, you also need to utilize your hero. You have four Dreadnoughts out on the board at this point, and what's very, very interesting about their hero is that you don't actually have to activate the system, nor does it have to be an unactivated system. You can move your Dreadnoughts and your flagship into any system you'd like as long as it doesn't contain other players' ships. This includes systems where you control things, as well as completely empty spaces. So, if you absolutely need some kind of positioning objective or taking somebody's homeworld, this is your go-to. You can also activate immediately afterwards with that fleet logistics I was talking about and move in where you need. You're going to lose a couple dreadnoughts most likely, but if you're winning the game off a take their home planet secret objective, this is definitely worth it. Also understand, they have sort of a command counter economy problem. Unlike the Nasroka, which I talked about in the last video, this might be their biggest weakness. They start off with zero influence and only two commodities. This is really rough. That's why you kind of can't be enemy number one at the table. You need to be able to sell that promissory note for even a trade good in order to get a command counter here or there, or you need to be able to become somebody's friend and ally with them, especially maybe they need to take a planet and they could use your alliance promissory note. I would possibly even suggest giving away support for the throne for a good amount of trade goods or anything, because that's just how unfortunately sparse it is. The L1Z1X benefits the most off of getting technology early, leadership mid-game in order to build back up your command counters, and then utilizing those 
tactical movements towards the late game, sort of flipping everything on their head and maybe even breaking alliances in order to assimilate into what you need at the moment. If there's a structure objective out, unfortunately, you'll just have to take down your friends. Hi. Uh, yes, sorry for the jut in. This is editing, Ethan. I'm currently editing this video and I realize I didn't talk about something that I bet a lot of you guys are going to want me to talk about. War Suns. Now, yes, it is true that War Suns have that incredible bombardment value, and LNZ1X would definitely get a lot out of it. Also, they do start with a red technology, which, uh, you know, sort of gets you there. An inheritance system is pushing you even closer towards War Sun. I think everything in their kit pushes you towards it. I just unfortunately think that War Sun is way too expensive once you actually research it, and getting that 12 as well as having to activate systems is just kind of a waste of resources and command counters, which you can do everything that a War Sun can do without a War Sun. So if you absolutely want your giant red balls on the game board, then do so. But if you can handle not you know, spending 12 for a Death Star, then I definitely suggest that option instead. Anyway, back to the video. Sorry for the jut in. Have a great day. Love you. They have a conniving playstyle, but I think that they're very powerful in their own right. The L1Z1X has been around from the first edition of the game, and they definitely have a place here. You just need to know how to use them properly, especially during the first and second round of the game. Enjoy your time as the L1Z1X, and check out the rest of my playlist up in the top right corner there or in the description below. I will see you next time. Thank you very much again. Pax Magnifica, Bellum Gloriosum.